All right, we've now seen a lot about elliptic curves and well, I promise you that we will also look into cryptanalysis. So also look into how hard it is to break. Now in this lecture, we are just setting up the, the systems, the hardness assumptions so that we actually know what we want to look for when we want to cryptanalyze something. I mean, you already noticed in the uh, perfect code example that you need to know whether you're looking for the key or for the message. And so also we need to know a little bit more of how our systems are being used and actually what the assumed to be hard problems are. So let's go back a little bit to the history um, where Diffie and Hellman 1976 introduced, well, they actually founded the field of public key cryptography. They said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could have, have actually something where you can put one key online, which is public and anybody can use it to encrypt to you and then have this private key part, which only you know and use the nature of well, mathematical functions being easy to do in one direction, which you'll use for encryption, and hard to do in the other direction, which you will be using for decryption for the attacker. And you need something which, well, makes it possible to decrypt for the legitimate user, namely the private key is some extra information which doesn't require the inclusion of this function, but to go around to still get decryption. Okay, so just to recap what the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is, it's not actually public key encryption, and it's amazing to look back at 1976 at their paper where they sort of said that they didn't achieve public key encryption, even though their paper is about it, they only achieved key exchange. Uh, fast forwarding to the mid of the 2000s, or at least 2010s, where it's pretty clear that what we really, really want is Diffie-Hellman key exchange. Um, encryption, yeah, nice, but we don't actually use public key encryption. When you look at the internet, it's typically Diffie-Hellman, or we use RSA in place of something which transports it. So, well, we've come away in more than 40 years. So, Diffie-Hellman key exchange can be written in any group G. And just to have kind of an abstract notation, I'll now write G as a group element, but I will move back to elliptic curve groups very, very soon. But we need to know what this group is, everybody needs to know this, and we need to know how to compute it. We have now seen a lot of ways of how to compute. We've seen Edwards curves, Firestrass curves, Montgomery curves, and so in our case, the group G would be the elliptic curve, and the lowercase g, the group element, would be a point on the curve. And of course, um, I already said with the clock that there are lots of warnings, but if you have any group, you can be amazingly unsafe. Remember the clock group with the powers of 5 and did this over the rationals? Well, I could have given you a much, much simpler example, namely if I just take the rationals and the multiplication of the group operations. So the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is computing, or the public key is computing g to the power of a. And then if somebody shows you ah, my public key that you can't possibly figure out what the secret key is for, uh, is 65536. Now, that one might ring a bell with you if you no large numbers or large powers of 2, well, you could figure out that this one means that the power of 2 is 60. And in general, I mean, you could just look at what the bit length is. Base 2 logarithm of this number gives you instantly the private key. So that is not good. But also if you're uh, going for integers modulo p, so you learn that you have to do some reduction, but instead of using multiplication, you're using addition. So you have some generator and you compute a times this generator, Put that as your public key. Think about it for a moment. Um, yeah, it's a generator and p is a prime, so you can just divide by g. You can just compute h sub a divided by g to get a. And then, well, can you compute this? Yes, it's just the integers mod p, and well, you're doing the additive group where you just create log, but it's the ring or the field even. So you also have a division operation. This doesn't break it over elliptic curve points because there's no such thing as, as taking a point and dividing by another point. You can add points and subtract points. You can do multiplications, but only by integers. There's no point divide by point. But here, well, we can divide h sub a divided by g modulo p. And the way to do this, just as a reminder, is you use the extended Euclidean algorithm. What even Hellman suggested in their paper was to use the fine field, yes, but the multiplicative, multiplicative group. So you use the times as the operation, 
So it's going to be g to the power a for your public key. And they want to have g as something which is a generator of the whole group. So g should be something which has order p minus 1. Now what we're doing currently in, in practice, and we'll get to the reasons in actually not this batch of videos, but the batch of videos for next week, is that we need to have that g has large prime order. So we don't actually want the whole group order. We want to have a part of it which has large prime order. So for instance, well, the order is p minus 1, so it calls all the elements of p, excluding 0. And since p is a large prime, well, p minus 1 is even. So there's definitely factor 2 in there, and there might be many more factors. If you take your guard to write your prime p, then p minus 1 typically has several factors. And then coming closer to what we've been doing so far, Miller and Kopitz in 1985 suggested to say, hey, look, we can use elliptic curves over a fine field. And well, they were using Weierstrass curves, which was the normal curve representation at the time. And they were not really specifying subgroups or something, but okay, the attacks that you're going to see now are already known. But well, I maybe could have said it's a subset equal. Now we definitely want to use subsets of prime order. So we're taking points on the optic curve over some fine field. We know what the addition of points looks like, and we want this order of the generator of this point P that we're picking, so P now it's of G, um, has prime order. So from now on, we're looking at the security notion, and, well, that comes with how to break it. Okay, so what are the security notions? The hardness assumptions, we have basically three of them. So in the Diffie-Hellman protocol, Remember the clock group where you have the arrows going across and the direct computation lines. So what the attacker Eve in the middle sees, well Eve, not like everybody else, knows the group or the computer in it and the base point. So I'm now back to using P because we've looking for more elliptic curves here. If you prefer multiple differentiation, replace with G, G to the A, G to the B. So the attacker sees Alice's key, A times P, Bob's key, B times P because those two parties exchange them publicly. And what Eve actually wants to do is she wants to compute the secret key ABP. And this problem, given P, AP, and BP, compute ABP, that is called the computational Diffie-Hellman problem. So CDP, computational Diffie-Hellman problem. There's also a decisional problem going with it. So it's always like, the computational problems say compute so and so, the decisional problems say decide whether so and so is the case. So, in the decisional Diffie-Hellman problem, you're not just giving three elements, public ones, public four, but you're also getting a candidate C times P, and you're asked to decide whether the C times P is the same as ABP. And then finally, the pure problem that, well, if you only see Alice's public key, you're seeing A times P, and you know how to compute in there. So given P, the base point, A times P, and then the problem of computing A, that is called the discrete logarithm problem. Now, if an attacker can solve the DLP, that means they can recover Alice's private key from her public key, well, then they can do everything that Alice does in the protocol. I mean, Alice knows her secret key. When she gets something with Bob, she can compute the shared key. So if an attacker can solve the DLP, then the attacker can also solve the CDP. And, well, if you can compute it, well, you can just compute ABP compared to B uh, C times P and realize whether it's equal or not. So there's definitely a degradation in hardness. So CDHP and DDHP can be easier than DLP. They cannot be harder to solve than the DLP. Okay, other, compa uh, other comparisons. Well, if you can solve the computation of your Hellman problem, then the decision of your Hellman problem is also easy. Again, just compute ABP and compare it with the candidate CP. Then something which we don't not going to see here, but it's well a bit more involved build over several papers, is that in many groups you can have you have an equivalence of DLP and CDHP. So if you can solve one, you can solve the other. Now one direction we have seen already 
in the other direction is a little bit more involved and typically involves some constants. So, for instance, you might need to solve the discrete log problem twice or three times in order to solve, uh, sorry, solve the computation to the Hammer problem three times in order to solve the discrete log problem once. So there's a small constant involved. It's not equal, but it's up to constant. And there are some groups which we'll see very late in the semester where the decision to the Hammer problem is significantly easier than the computation. Typically, we assume that all of those are about as hard, but there are exceptions. Okay, so last slide is, or no, two slides up, how we're going to use this in practice. So one thing you should ask yourself whenever I'm saying, hey, well, Alice and Bob sent those things to each other or post them on the web pages, um, how do they actually know that they talk to the right person? How do we know that there's not a, well, what we call man in the middle attack, which is a little bit uh, funny when you think that Eve is the attacker, so it should be woman in the middle attack, or Eve in the middle attack. So what we have here is that instead of Alice talking to Bob, we have that Bob and, well, there's an Eve in the middle, so Alice talks to Eve, and then Eve relays to Bob. So if they can't talk to each other directly, but Eve sits in the middle and manages all the conversation, then we have that Eve will send well, she picks her if you how much she, uh, keys. So she picks some E and some F. They can be the same, they can be different. And then she sends EP, her public key, to Alice, claiming that this is Bob's key. And she also sends FP to Bob, claiming that this is Alice's key. So now both of those think that they have a key from the other part, the part that they want to talk to, while they actually have keys that they share with Eve. So then, well, A computes the a AEP, and Bob computes the BFP, and Eve is also able to compute both of these keys because, well, she actually got the real keys from Alice and Bob. Now this becomes interesting when there's some messages going on, so I was motivating the Diffie Hellman key exchange of this whole uh, subject that we're currently in by saying, look, when you connect to a web page, um, you don't know the web page and you still can get a shared key. And then I said, well, this is public key cryptography. We're doing this first. We're going to get to symmetric key cryptography later. And, well, this symmetric key cryptography is going to use this key. Well, but now if they actually share any key with Eve, then if Alice wants to talk to Bob, then, well, she'll encrypt to Eve. Eve decrypts, well, that's what she's interested in, to get the message. She stores this, but, well, it also has to go to Bob because it's kind of awkward if Bob doesn't know what Alice wants from him, they, under the illusion that they are talking to each other. So then, well, Eve re-encrypts this he shared with Bob to Bob, then Bob gets this, decrypts, well, maybe she sends a reply. So all of those go via Eve, um, who always is decrypting and re-encrypting. Now, this assumes that Eve is in charge of the network. So it's not that suddenly Alice sends the message and it reaches Bob directly. Eve is somewhere on the line, so Bob and Alice can't talk directly, at least not via the crypto system. And you might think, well, this is kind of unlikely. I mean, I'm sitting here, I'm in, talking to Bob over there, I see him, I, I show him my public key. And well, if you're in that situation, that is great. If you can compare your keys out of band, if you actually have authenticity there, that's fine. But you know, in my example of you reaching my, my course homepage, you actually have not met me or my computer, which is certainly the public key, and you're actually going over the internet and while well, there is your computer talking to some Wi-Fi hotspot, the Wi-Fi hotspot talking to an internet service provider. The internet service provider sends this packet onto the greater internet, eventually it reaches my internet service provider and my server. And each of those nodes, there could be an Eve. Well, okay, the more, most interesting ones, if she's targeting me, would be my ISP. And if she's targeting Bob, would be Bob's ISP. And Eve can totally control those. So it's a, it's a realistic model, but it's also a very strong model. Okay, so this is a man-in-the-middle attack. Well, we call this a stealth man-in-the-middle attack because, well, as long as Eve is decrypting and re-encrypting, Alice and Bob cannot notice 
the deadly man in the middle, um, unless at some point they get into a situation where they can actually say, hey, by the way, I'm using this, this public key, and then Alice will tell to Bob the EP, and Bob goes like, that's not my public key, and then they realize that something went wrong. For instance, they could call each other and read out the public key. But, you know, our public keys are 26 bits, so nobody will do this. Okay, you can go for fingerprint, you can have a shorter thing, then Eve can put in more effort to generate another thing, so there's kind of an arms race. So, well, we need to we need to deal with this, and the way we'll deal with this eventually is going to be via signatures. But, first we do some TCP tags. Another way, well, this is not really how my server is talking to you, right? I mean, my server has a public key. It's not that it's just waiting for you to do something. Well, actually, currently there is a, something going on where it's sort of waking up when you talk to it. But a very normal way of encrypting is what we call the semi-static before Hellman. Um, so this is kind of the first full crypto system we're seeing, where I'm just hand-waving off uh, in the direction of symmetric key cryptography. So a hybrid system is something that's combining public key and symmetric key cryptography. Or in general, hybrid means you're combining more than one system. So it used to be just talking about public key and symmetric key, where the purpose of the public key is to get, well, a key, and then symmetric crypto does the bottom function. Okay, so here we have Alice, and she now publicly posts her long-term public key. And maybe she has this on a bulletin board, and maybe she puts this princess out somewhere, so that everybody can really con uh, be convinced it's her key, and she keeps a long-term private key. And now, while Alice posts this, now some random user comes along. They don't actually want to go like, hey, Alice, are you awake? They just download this key and then can encrypt to Alice by doing the following. So they're doing the asymmetric part of the diff helmet. So they now generate a key, which could be just a one-time key. So they pick a random K key, uh, key K, um, compute the normal diff helmet operation. So they're doing K times P, gives you this point R. And then, um, well, the shared key would be k times Alice's public key, so k times pa. And then, well, this is now an elliptic curve point, or in general, it's a curve alignment. Your symmetric key cryptography, well, we haven't seen any yet, but I can promise you it doesn't want elliptic curve points in there. So what it wants is a bit string. It wants just, well, n bits zero one, um, well, it should be sufficient random and so on, so well, okay, but you want a deterministic function that takes a group element and maps it to an n-bit bit string. And what we're using there is called a key derivation function the, um, that takes, that does exactly this function. Okay, so whatever user this is, let's say it's Bob, he computes the shared key, the k times pa, he computes the kdf on it, and uses that as a symmetric key to compute some ciphertext. And then he can send the ciphertext without any more interaction with Alice, sends the ciphertext, but he also needs to send what normally would be, well, in the Hamann key change in this interactive protocol, what would be his, his key share. So he's sending this R as well. And then eventually Alice wakes up and she notices that, okay, well, somebody wants to talk to me, let's see what they have. And then just the same as in the Hamann, she can recover the shared key, well, because her public key, PA, is A times P, and she knows lowercase a, and she gets R, so she can get the shared key as well, then close the KDF with it, and gets the same symmetric key, and then does a symmetric key encryption. All right, so Alice's key here is static. Um, Bob's key is what we call ephemeral, so it's the well, short term, or it's it's there and then it's gone. So ephemeral just means something that is not permanent. Um, some people use ephemeral to mean one time, but well, it's not the same word. One time really means one time. Um, ephemeral can be more general. So you can have situations where ephemeral keys stick around for a bit longer. So don't rely on it being gone after one use. Okay, so finally, um, well, I have mentioned the security notions already. So if the attacker can compute the DLP or CDHP, 
that solve those, then they compute the, the shared secret. And if they can solve the decisional Yokohama problem, well, then have a guess for what the key could be. So they can confirm the guess for the key. Okay, that's it for now.